Good evening. Thank you all for attending tonight's Public Safety Committee hearing to share the Columbus Division of Police body-worn camera policy, Ohio Revised Code recommendations, and projected implementation costs. I would like to thank my council colleagues for attending this evening's hearing, Council President Zach Klein, Mike Senziano, Jiza Page, President Pro Tem Tyson, and Shannon Harden. Copies of tonight's agenda, body-worn camera policy recommendations, frequently asked questions regarding the Columbus Division of Police body camera program are available at the entrance of council chambers. Body-worn cameras are the next stage in advancing the technology used by the Division of Police. However, this is not the first time law enforcement has implemented camera technology. The use of cruiser cameras and community cameras has had a significant impact on policing. Cameras are a tool that can be used to document interactions between law enforcement and the public. It is not a panacea for accountability. At this time, I'd like to ask Council President Zach Klein for any comments. Uh, thank you, Council Member Brown, for hosting the hearing and to my colleagues for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, I am pleased that we are at the point uh, close to the body camera implementation. I feel like as a, as a council member prior to becoming council president uh, when I chaired public safety uh, for several years, uh, that we've been talking about the possibility of body-worn cameras now for 18 months uh, or perhaps more, uh, and that we're at the point where um, we will have the implementation by the end of the year, beginning of uh, Q1 of 2017. Uh, and that, as you noted, Councilmember Brown, I, I think this is an important policy for the police department as well as for the community when it comes to accountability, uh, just like our efforts to increase diversity within our ranks. Uh, but none of this, po this policy or even the other policy I mentioned uh, in itself is a silver bullet uh, that will solve all of uh, society's issues, concerns, perceptions, realities um, with the community and the police department, but they are enormous steps in the right direction uh, to help improve the relationship uh, between the police department and uh, law enforcement and the criminal justice system. So thank you, Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Council President Klein. At this particular time, I would now like to invite Public Safety Director Ned Pettis Jr., Deputy Director George Speaks, Chief of Police Kim Jacobs, and Commander Robert Strauss to provide a staff presentation on the body and warrant camera policy. Director. Council President Klein, Public Safety Chairman Brown, and Council Members, it is an honor to be here tonight. Since the events beginning in Ferguson, the topic of police community relations has been at the forefront of our national, state, and local dialogue. A centerpiece of this dialogue is body cameras. Body cameras have been shown to increase transparency, accountability, improve trust between the police and the community, and provide strong evidentiary material for the judicial system. Moreover, body cameras have been statistically proven to both significantly reduce use of force by officers and reduce citizen complaints against officers. In short, people act better if they know they are being recorded. Mayor Ginther, Council President Klein, and Council Member Brown and City Council have not only recognized the many benefits of body cameras, but have also dedicated tremendous resources towards outfitting our Columbus Division of Police with this rapidly developing technology. I am happy to report we are well on our way to have the first phase of implementation, which is our traffic bureau, outfitted with body cameras before year's end. I'd like to begin our presentation tonight by providing a brief overview of public safety in the city of Columbus. I do this with the intent of demonstrating that given the great size of our city, the tremendous volume of calls for service we receive from the public, and the many types of dangerous calls for service that our police officers respond to literally every hour of the day, that body cameras will be a tremendous tool to ever enhance police community relationships and public safety. Specifically, we want to discuss and provide you tonight an overview of policing in the city of Columbus, why implement body cameras, components of implementing body cameras, policy, public records, 
cost and procurement, and final thoughts and unknowns. I am proud to report that our Division of Police is nationally accredited. This means we are recognized as the gold standard in law enforcement. This is an extremely difficult honor to obtain, and only a very few major cities across the nation have been awarded this distinction. We have approximately 1,900 sworn and approximately 340 civilian personnel. We are one of the largest cities in the nation, 820,000 people and 222 square miles. In fact, you can add the cities of Cleveland and Cincinnati together, and they do not equal Columbus in population or square miles. With a city this big, our public safety forces are very busy. An example, in 2015, the Division of Police received an astounding 1.3 million calls for service. These calls include responding to violent and dangerous situations, 17,925 domestic violence calls, 6,102 shots fired, 5,695 person with a gun, 2,283 person with a knife, 1,216 cutting and stabbing, and 739 shooting calls for service. Now my hope is not to alarm you with these statistics. Please allow me to place these numbers in the context of historical trends in Columbus and in context with other large cities across our nation. When we review our crime rates over the years, we see that violent crime in our city has been steadily decreasing, as indicated by the red line on the graph. At the same time, our population is increasing, as indicated by the blue line. Violent crime incidents were approximately 7,000 in the year 2000, according to this graph, and the population was just under 770,000. Population rose to 820,000 in 2014, but violent crime was down to 4,500 incidents. This remarkable inverse relationship of rising population and decreasing crime is something few, if any, major cities in the United States can boast. When we review the FBI's data about violent crime rates in major cities, Columbus is one of the safest largest cities in our nation. Likewise, the major city's chief's crime survey recently underscored that Columbus is one of the very few large cities in America that has not seen an increase in violent crime. Although Columbus is twice the size of Cincinnati and Cleveland, Cincinnati had nearly twice as many violent crimes and Cleveland had nearly three times as many. There is an old adage that says the devil is in the details. My Deputy Director George Speaks chaired a committee, many members of which are here tonight, to grapple with the voluminous and difficult details of implementing body cameras in our great city. He will now provide an overview of the outstanding work of the City of Columbus Body Worn Cameras Committee with respect to promulgating a national best practice policy for our police officers to follow, drafting recommended Ohio revised code changes in order to properly balance the sometimes competing interests of transparency and privacy, and to estimate the very significant cost of implementation. Deputy Director Speaks. Thank you, Director. So why implement body cameras? Body cameras will undoubtedly strengthen police community relations, and this has been shown to enhance transparency increase accountability, improve trust between officers and the public, provide sometimes incredible evidentiary material for the criminal justice system, and assist in training. And we pride ourselves on training here in the city of Columbus. I say that due to a number of studies. The first, uh, for, first of all, body cameras began in Europe. And the first study that we've seen occurred in Aberdeen, Scotland. In that study, they found body cameras resulted in a 14.3% uh, less citizens complaints and less assaults on officers. In Mesa, Arizona, for example, they found a dramatic 75% less 
uh, use of force on the part of officers, and 40% less citizens' complaints. Sorry, in Plymouth, England, they found that body cameras were a tremendous uh, aid to prosecution, and they found that they had less and less trials and far greater, uh, a greater number of guilty pleas. In Rialto, California, they again found a dramatic decrease in use of force by officers and a dramatic 88% decrease in citizens' complaints. And in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, again, complaints against officers declined and domestic violence convictions significantly increased due to uh, the amazing evidence that body cameras are able to provide. So as Director uh, Pettis stated, why is this? Uh, I believe that people simply, as Director Pettis said, act better if they know they're being recorded. And the second thing we can take from these studies is the footage can be very, very strong uh, evidence. So Mayor, former Mayor Coleman and Mayor Ginther formed a committee, and we were to look at the components of implementing body cameras. Specifically, the committee was charged with promulgating a national best practice policy for a division of police officers to follow, to address public records. As you will see, there is sometime of a, sometimes a clash of values. On one hand, transparency, and on the other hand, privacy. And we've tried to balance those two values, both in our policy and, as you'll see, uh, recommendations to the Ohio Legislature. Last, we will project cost, and we'll go over the $8.5 million projection uh, for direct cost, and there'll be some additional uh, cost for indirect cost. And two things that are ongoing, uh, collective bargaining, we are now meeting with the FOP on this policy, and secondly, the procurement process. A bid has been put out, we have tested cameras, and Commander Strassball will go, to, go into greater detail on where we're at in the procurement side. The body camera committee that was uh, convened, very talented individuals, very diverse backgrounds, who approached a multitude of issues from many different angles and vantage points. And while there was not unanimity on each of the issues, there's, we certainly were able to get to consensus. The resulting policy, I believe you'll find, is very balanced. It's tailored to the city of Columbus, uh, and it fits very well within Ohio law, and I believe will, will serve as a national best uh, practice policy. You can see the, the committee members, including Bo Chilton, who heads the CEO of Community Action. Uh, Kyle Urjak is a sergeant with the Fraternal Order of Police. Gil Hill, a local business owner. Uh, Margo Kaminsky, a uh, law professor uh, at Ohio State, uh, whose bailiwick, by the way, is, is privacy in the law. Uh, Carla Rothen, the executive director of Stonewall Union. Abdi Sofofi with our Community Relations Commission. Bob Stewart uh, with Public Safety, Commander uh, Bobby Strassball, and the Reverend C. Dexter uh, Wise III of Faith Ministries. In addition to these folks, we had both internal and external experts. Uh, for example, we had Laura Baker, the Chief Prosecutor of the City of Columbus, Jeff Furby, the Chief Legal Advisor, Carrie Bonaventura of uh, Department of Public Safety, our IT Coordinator, Jonathan Schrigg, uh, who is in the Public Records over the Division of Police, uh, Gail Patrick, an attorney at law formerly with the Legal Aid Society of Columbus, Ivan King, uh, Deputy Director of Technology, and Kate Bashadi of uh, then City Council and now Public Safety. In addition, we took voluminous uh, uh, testimony uh, from a variety of folks, including the Ohio Attorney General's Office, the Ohio Newspaper Association. Uh, we had the ACLU look over uh, materials. We conducted in all, I believe, seven months of research, uh, we looked at, next slide, the best practices in the country. There are four model policies by the Police Executive Research Forum, the ACLU, the National FOP, Labor Relations Information System. Uh, likewise, we had 25 policies from around the country, uh, voluminous articles and voluminous videos of body camps from across the country. Uh, we did this so as to not reinvent the wheel, but I believe we certainly improved upon it, and we learned, quite frankly, a lot from the mistakes of others. A real quick example, uh, we learned that Las Vegas invested millions. However, their officers were not able to upload their cameras because they did not have fiber optics. Council has graciously just approved $1.5 million in the capital budget, and those uh, uh, RFPs are on the street now, so we will, are now putting into place that fiber optics so that we'll be able to upload that video. So thank you, Las Vegas. 
Columbus Body Worn Policy. We delved into an incredible amount of issues. And let me say that there, there's no single best policy, but we took all the material and crafted uh, a policy that is both very broad, covers multitude of factors, and very in-depth. Things such as who should wear the cameras? Uh, are officers allowed to privately own cameras? Official reports? What do you record? How do you train? Should you inform the public? How long should you remain in recording mode? What's the officer discretion to turn off the camera? How do you tag the videos? What's our retention schedule? How do we store the videos? Can officers review the courting? Can management review the courting? Are we, who has access? How is uh, externally, how do you release the data? What statistics uh, are we going to review? And if officers fail to adhere to the policy, will they be disciplined? A number of different items that uh, we covered. And now I want to go into some of these in detail. The first policy, who should wear? Uh, our committee recommends that every first responder out of 1,900 officers here in Columbus, we want to give 432, approximately 432 first responders. Yes, 14, yeah. Sorry, I can't see with my glasses that fine print. Uh, their own body camera. Uh, however, folks in secondary roles, for example, we have approximately 20 helicopter pilots. Uh, we have some folks in research and development. Those folks who don't have direct contact, who, who aren't a first responder, it is not recommended that they receive uh, the cameras. So in addition to that, there's a recommendation for an additional 10% cachet of cameras. Again, we learned from other jurisdictions that cameras break, you need to immediately replace them. So we want a 10% uh, extra uh, as we purchase. This is one of the, uh, a subject that took an extraordinary amount of uh, time to uh, review and make a recommendation, that is what to record. And as you're about to see, we have a three-part test here in the city. Number one, first part is any law enforcement action. What is a law enforcement action? It's defined for you there. All investigatory stops, calls for service, traffic and pedestrian stops, SWAT forced entries, OVI, any use of force, an arrest, or any time uh, a situation becomes ad adversarial, an officer is required to record that. Now, what wouldn't be? Let's say I'm new to town. I say, excuse me, officer, I'm new to town. Could you recommend a restaurant? That's not a law enforcement encounter. Something like that would not be recorded. As I said before, many times there is a clash of values. And it's a clash between transparency, and that value would uphold that camera should be on as much as possible, versus privacy. That value would uphold that cameras should be shut off. In order to uphold, uh, to balance those, you'll see when we get to policy seven, we're going to give the officer some discretion to turn the camera off. We'll come back to that in a moment. Whether to inform. In Columbus, the officer will say, sir, ma'am, I'm recording. Body cameras are not to be surreptitious here in Columbus. We want to let folks know they are being recorded. Coming back now to officer discretion in, in 11. So remember, the first part is cameras will come on during a law enforcement encounter, and those are defined. How, uh, however, in order to remain sensitive to the dignity of folks, to be cognizant of privacy rights, the officers will be allowed to, or have the discretion, to turn off the camera in two situations. One dealing with sensitive persons, and the other dealing with sensitive places. Who are those persons? As you can see in number one, crime victim, especially victims of rape, incest, stalking, or other forms of sexual assault. Minors, confidential or police informants persons experiencing significant mental or emotional distress, persons who exhibit severe bodily injury, who are nude or partially nude, and implicitly that would also, uh, sex would, uh, you, that would cover, uh, and the deceased. What are the special places? Well, inside of a private home, uh, or inside of a business, a uh, school, at a private entertainment venue, museum, or facility where intellectual property issues 
uh, may become an issue at a funeral, at a place of worship, or inside critical infrastructure. So let me go back. Camera's on, law enforcement encounter. Officer has discretion to turn the camera off in two situations, dealing with sensitive people, sensitive places. However, that discretion is going to be taken away in three circumstances. If during, there's an arrest, if there's a use of force, or if things become adversarial. It is a three-part test we're utilizing here in Columbus. The reason for that is, again, to balance these sometimes competing interests of transparency and privacy. We're going to give some examples of videos where we'll see this potential clash in a moment. Here we go. Just as we want to protect the privacy of the public, we also want to protect the privacy of our officers. So some things internally are prohibited, such as recording in the locker room, showers, restroom. Uh, those things should not uh, occur uh, between, within the uh, officer setting. Likewise, we have some external. For example, if you recall, there were some issues in New York City where it was alleged the Department of Homeland Security was using body cameras or cameras to uh, find out who was attending certain gatherings, which we believe may be violating, violative of the First Amendment. We will not do that. We will not gather intelligence information based solely on First Amendment protected speech, association, or religion here in the city of Columbus. This is also one of the highly debated uh, issues around the country, officer review of court recordings. Uh, many hours are spent on this. The committee felt that officers should be able to review a recording here in Columbus. There was a variety of reasons. Uh, one, the uh, Department of Justice funded PERF study's recommendation was to do that in order to ensure accuracy. Two, we looked at uh, policies from around the country. The only one that we could find that did uh, ban the review of the recordings was a small place called Littleton, Colorado. It's the only one in the country we could find. And third, and I think what swayed the committee, the film is what the film is. It doesn't really make a difference. When an officer reviews the uh, recording, uh, that film will stand and speak for itself. Likewise, management will be reviewing recordings. Uh, we pride ourselves on our training. As you know, our officers here spend almost twice as much as training as a state of Ohio minimum uh, in order to be a Columbus police officer. We want to utilize uh, these recordings just as my, for example, my son and his football team utilize the game film uh, every Monday after the Friday night game. Uh, it can be very beneficial to improve performance. And lastly, discipline. A failure to adhere to this policy uh, may result in discipline, uh, as with the violation of any of our policies uh, here in Columbus. We talked some about this balancing or competing interest between transparency, in which the camera needs to be on, versus privacy, in which the camera needs to be off. Now remember, Ohio is an open record state, unlike other states in which body camera footage is not a public record. California, Florida, for example. And while I don't believe mainstream media is an issue, anyone can make a public records request. And if you go to YouTube right now and you type in, I did this afternoon to get these numbers, police body camera, you'll find over 700 sites post body cameras, and there are over 270,000 videos when you type in police body cameras. Now, police are oftentimes called on a person's worst or possibly most embarrassing day of someone's life. In order to respect dignity and uphold privacy, we are making a number of recommendations to amend Ohio Public's Records Law in order to redact. Now, notice I didn't say to ban, as in California and Florida, but rather to redact certain videos. The committee makes these recommendations after reviewing numerous, numerous videos, a few of which I'd like to share with you now. The first example uh, deals with the domestic violence. As I mentioned before, a study found that do domestic violence convictions dramatically increased with the implementation of body cameras. And it's easy to literally see why. A judge or jury is able to see emotions and the demeanor of the assailant and the victim during or shortly after an attack or, or an, uh, shortly after an incident. You will be able to see 
physical characteristics, tears, bruising, perhaps blood. This is very powerful demonstrative evidence. But DVs, likewise, domestic violence, are also some of our most dangerous calls for officers. And for transparency's sake, we want to capture what occurs. On the other hand, so this is that flip side of the, of the coin, if you will. What if an act of domestic violence did not occur? What if force was not used by the police? By posting a video obtained by a public records request, the public will be able to see the inside of someone's home, where their valuables are, how the house is laid out, how one looks in the middle of the night in a very potentially embarrassing situation. Such is the case for Cleveland Browns coach Andy Moeller, whose encounter with the police was shortly posted on YouTube. Hello, sir. How you doing? You Andrew? Come on in. Can we yes. talk to you? Yeah. You all right? Yeah, yes. You and Sandy get into it or something? Or, or, well, or she left and trashed my house. So really? All right. So I don't know what fiance? she sold you. I haven't talked to her yet, so I don't, I don't know. So what, what happened? Uh, she got mad, and I'm in the middle of cleaning up all the glass. Okay. It's all over my house. What? And I don't know what she told you. I, I, I have all this to clean up, and I've been sweeping up the entire uh, what? We have glass here. What would you do that for? 16, 17. And I have glass back there, and she's, I think the window's broke. I gotta look back there. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, she threw that over there, so. Well, how'd, she, how'd she do all this? What's that? I mean, how'd this happen, man? Did you start? She's mad at me, mm -hmm. and she went off, and. Sir, that, that, that's... Just started breaking stuff? She threw it all over, all, all, over, all over the wall over there, 21. all over the wall over here, and I'm just cleaning it up. I don't know where she's at. I don't know okay. if you talked to her. Yeah, she, she, she called. She went, she, she went walking down the street. Yeah, well, uh, that, yeah. And so I'm did it get that guy here and all that. Again, I would argue there is not a public interest in this particular video of Coach Moeller. Charges were not filed. There was not an act of violence that took place. Um, quite frankly, it's quite embarrassing. Uh, that is why when we get to our recommendations, you'll see we believe that videos such as that should be, uh, we should be able to redact those images. A second video deals with the mental health crisis. Okay. All right, April, let me try it first. First, I gotta let you know I got my body camera okay, rolling because cool, cool. we have to do fancy body fine, cameras. That's okay. Fine. Um, and you work out at Eastern? Yeah, well, I have my um, doctrine out there. I'm a PPP, HD, okay. MD. Yes, MD. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, you're also April Romero, right? Well, I used to be, but I'm, okay. I'm an Eastman. I'm kidnapped, but well, that's another story. Okay, but well. I, do, I do own the hospital. Okay. Well, anyway, um, he's not from this planet. He's not human. He's like a wolverine. He was like an animal. It was the sickest thing I ever saw in my life. And I've been studying it for a while, and I tried to get out there today and get him admitted, and I couldn't, but it's bad. He's real, he's not human. He needs, like, um, x-rays and tests and all kinds of, like, a GI and upper and all kinds right. of stuff. I'm going to do in thesis then. Obviously, this lady is in the midst of a health crisis. Under current law, that video is a public record. As you'll see, the committee is going to make a recommendation that such videos uh, depicting such scenes should be redacted. A third video. Um, yes, that's the one, Grant. As you know, we currently have a heroin epidemic throughout our nation. Oh, he's breathing. He's breathing. He's okay. Hey, bud. Yeah, he's breathing. Hey. Hey, wake up, bud. Wake up, man. Hey, dude. You all right? You with us? You doing okay? Hey, stay with me, man. Stay with me. Stay with me, bud. It's fine, Grant. We're going to have one Hispanic male. The video depicted a heroin overdose. And again, as you know, we are well in, in the midst of a national epidemic. Once this young man recovers, such videos could be detrimental to him in the future in terms of employment, socially. Such videos are currently a public record. Again, we should be allowed to redact such videos.
I'd like to put you the last video tonight. This is a redacted video by mainstream video uh, media. Flagstaff police releasing that body camera video. It is chilling as it shows the officer approaching the suspect in a domestic violence case. Everything seems very normal until that suspect suddenly pulls a gun. Is there any anything I can do between you guys? You need someone to exchange some keys or? The video from Officer Tyler Stewart's body camera begins in his patrol car on the afternoon of Saturday, December 27th. The 24-year-old officer out looking for a suspect in a domestic violence case. He found the man, 28-year-old Robert Smith, in a neighborhood off West Clay Avenue in Flagstaff. Officer Stewart calmly questions Smith about what happened between him and his girlfriend. You don't have any weapons in your pockets or anything like that? No, sir, I'm just cold. Okay. I not let me eat today. Okay. How bad is the pain? On a scale of 1 to 10, like a 12. Like a 12? It shoots up to here. 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 Okay. <sighs> okay. So, I was in the area. Uh -huh. Got some other calls coming in, but I thought I'd swing by. During their conversation, Stewart asks to search Smith to make sure he doesn't have any weapons and things change in a split okay. second. You mind if I just pat down your pockets real quick? You don't have anything in here? No, no. Okay. Nothing in here? No, this is my smoke. Okay. The video, too graphic to show from here, but Flagstaff PD says you hear three gunshots and the camera goes to the ground. Then three more shots from Smith's 22 caliber handgun. The body camera moves slightly, all within a four-second time frame. After the sixth shot, there is nine seconds of silence on the video, followed by what investigators believe is the sound of Officer Stewart's service weapon cycling, then a seventh and final round is heard. Officer Stewart was pronounced dead a short time later. Flagstaff police... That video was too graphic for mainstream media to post. However, someone did post the horrific uncut video on YouTube. It was eventually taken down, but not initially. Videos such as that, there is no public interest and should not uh, be available to post on YouTube. So with respect to public records, we want to balance again, and our policy, I believe, does an incredible job of balancing the values of transparency and privacy. And in order that we may redact situations uh, that invades one's reasonable expectation of privacy, we are making a number of recommendations to the Ohio legislature. Here we go. The first, that the death of a person, uh, a deceased body, if you will, should not be a public record, with, unless, two exceptions, unless the death was caused by a law enforcement officer, that would make it a public interest, or number two, the consent of the estate is obtained. The second, uh, similarly, the death of a police officer or a first responder, uh, similarly, should not be for display on, on, uh, as a public record. Assume the person doesn't die, but there's a horrific injury. And there are some videos on the uh, YouTube that are brutal. Um, Again, such videos should not be a public record. Number five, the exposure of a person's private body parts. In other words, nudity and implicitly sex acts uh, would be exempt. We believe that number six, juveniles. Number seven, personal health care information. Think of the number of times an officer responds to a hospital or to a clinic or to an ER and information may be overheard or taped inadvertently. You may not even be the subject of the video that things are recorded. That should not be part of a public record. And lastly, victims, victims of crime, especially victims of sex crimes. Number nine, um, as you know, people provide information to the police, and by doing so, they could be put in jeopardy. We want to protect these informants. Number 10, an officer may ask you, for example, for who you are and for some corroborating information, such as your date of birth, your social security number, your address. This information should not be posted publicly. Number 11, tactics that the police generally use. Now the implementation of those tactics we believe should be filmed, but the discussion as to what those tactics are should not. 
Number uh, 12, non-work-related conversations. Again, we also want to protect the privacy of the officers. If an officer is talking about his home life, if he's talking about uh, the football game this past weekend, that should not be the subject of a public record. 13, there's an adage that uh, one's home is their castle. We believe that the inside of a residence should not be a public record unless, again, there's a use of force or adversarial encounter. There's then a public interest, which we believe that that video should be in the public realm. So these are 13 uh, additional exemptions, additional exemptions to Ohio Revised Code 149 that we will be approaching the legislature uh, to amend so that we are able to, again, redact these items that we believe are an invasion of privacy and, uh, and quite frankly, are, could be very embarrassing and or horrific to uphold the value of dignity. Two other recommendations. One is the uh, exempting security and infrastructure records. Uh, for example, if one is in a jail, we don't believe the, the layout of that jail should become a public record. And lastly is pandering obscenity. Let's assume, for example, and this does happen, that officers catch uh, someone uh, in a sex act. Uh, we get a public records request. Under current law, we have to fulfill that public records request. On the other hand, there's a criminal prohibition against pandering obscenity. The state legislature needs to take cities out of this quagmire that, that is possible under current law between this rock and a hard place, if you will. Which law do, do we follow? The committee successfully uh, accomplished its first two tasks. We talked about the policy. Number two, we talked about the Ohio Revised Code recommendations. Lastly, the committee was charged with projecting cost. And as you know, uh, capital budget-wise, we've already allocated $1.5 million for fiber optics. You'll see here at the very bottom right an estimated cost of $8.5 million to implement body cameras here in the city of Columbus. Let me forewarn you, these are direct costs. These include the cost of the camera, the warranties, the docking stations, the accessories, uh, training, the very expensive, uh, all that stuff, if you will, is about a third. The really expensive part of body cameras, it's the storage. Now, we have a three-part records retention policy here in the city of Columbus. Uh, a, if it is non-related to a case, that video can go away within 90 days, therefore not take up server space. If, on the other hand, it is a criminal matter, that video is kept at a minimum of two years. However, if it is a critical incident, or if it is a major incident, Due to post-conviction appeals and some very long statute limitations dealing with property, this video can literally be kept forever. So the most expensive aspect, again, is not the cameras. Rather, it will be the storage cost going forward. Which brings us to final thoughts and a note. Good evening. Thank you, Council. I'm Commander Robert Strasbaugh. I was tasked by uh, Chief of Police Kimberly Jacobs uh, to be part of this uh, research on body cameras. Uh, body cameras is currently a rapidly evolving technology, and things are changing daily. A lot of the corporations who have instituted these uh, devices are taking the words of the folks in the field that are using them and constantly making them better. As we had a growing curve with our mobile cameras and our cruisers, so too will we have that same learning curve with body cameras. Technology will, will go forward and allow the ability for these cameras to come on without human error. Currently, it has to be turned on by a human. Uh, there are triggers that are being developed in the workplace, uh, none are currently available, that uh, will allow heart rate to be monitored if a weapon is pulled out uh, of the holster, a camera would be activated. And there are systems that are currently in the works that where if the mobile camera is activated, so too will the body camera be activated. So as technology evolves, I would ask council to keep that in mind that the camera that we get today may not be the camera that we'll have in three to four years because of technology. Our redaction, there are some 
vendors who are giving us an estimate of four to one for every one hour of video to redact that video is four hours. That is to sit through it and to listen to it because we have to be cognizant of releasing personal information such as social security numbers and driver's license numbers so that we reduce any chance of us being part of someone's identity being victimized. We'll have to increase our civilian workforce to have people watch these videos and to redact based upon hopefully the changes of the Ohio legislators. That's imperative for the privacy of our citizens. Storage costs, uh, records retention, as uh, the director talked about, uh, there's going to be a growing pain with that as well. Officers have to download these videos. Our substations are being updated with fiber optics per the money that you have allocated. Our collective bargaining unit uh, with the FOP uh, is another process. We are currently in midterm uh, negotiations, which I'm sure Chief Jacobs can speak of, and to make sure that we do it right and we do it right the first time. The one thing that I am proud of is I was born and raised in this city, and we are, in my opinion, the progressive leaders in law enforcement when it comes to this issue. The procurement process uh, is currently underway. We, we tested several vendors. Uh, we put them out in the field. We had a variety of officers, a variety of body shapes, uh, to make sure that the cameras are worn and we capture the best video quality that we can. We started out at a higher number of, um, of proposals that were sent to us. We whittled that down to about six. And then from that six, we whittled that down to even further, which is now the RFP that the director was speaking of is down to two. And I cannot answer any questions about that process uh, because I've been told by the procurement office I'm not allowed to, but our uh, purchasing office uh, is in the process of those negotiations right now. It is our desire in the Columbus Division of Police and Chief Jacobs, as she directed me, to get the best possible equipment for the citizens of Columbus and for our members of our Division of Police. Training. Our training, we will take the policy. It's going through a concurrent process right now with our executive staff. It was been reduced to our directive format. It's being reviewed. And then the training bureau is taking that policy and is creating a lesson plan. We're one of the few academies in the state of Ohio that are allowed to create our own lesson plans and subsequently submit them to the state for approval. That is currently being done. And our goal is on December uh, 1st or the first week thereof to have 55 of the uh, Traffic Bureau officers, the first 55 to get cameras, trained in what the policy is, when to turn them on, when to turn them off, and how to operate them and how to upload them. With that, I'll turn it over to my boss, uh, Chief Jacobs, and thank you again for allowing me the time to talk about this issue. Good evening, Council President Klein. I will turn that that way. Council members, Director Pettis, and all that are, are here, um, I appreciate your time, and I'm very grateful to Director Speaks and the entire Body Worn Camera Committee um, and its advisors for their really tireless efforts, um, thorough efforts, and very detailed recommendations. Um, we, we do strive to make sure that we are in line with the best practices and they um, did enough research to assure me that we are there. Um, this is a public safety initiative that will have a dramatic impact on our community, on our officers, and as noted, on our budget as well, um, and our personnel time. It is an investment, though, in our future, and one that we believe can improve transparency and accountability, while at the same time documenting the countless hours of courageous and committed policing that is going on in our community by our very dedicated personnel. Our division takes pride, as Commander Strasbaugh just noted, in being progressive and in being community-minded. 
And I believe that this new initiative will allow us to continue using best practices that are currently available to provide excellent public service as we always strive to do. So thank you. Council President, at this particular time, there are some invited speakers I'd like to have come up and address some issues. There will certainly be an opportunity for members of this council to ask questions, but I think it's imperative that they hear from all those folks who are appropriately involved in this process. And I'd also like to thank the city attorney, Rick Pfeiffer, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, at this particular time, if state representatives, uh, uh, Kevin Boyce is present. Good evening. Uh, thank you, President Klein, uh, Chairman Brown, and, and members of council. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to stand before you today. I really believe that much of what has been said uh, was going to be reflected in some of my comments about the historic perspective on body camera research. Uh, so I'll cut to the chase uh, in some of my notes. I'd be remiss if I didn't first mention and thank uh, Deputy Director George Speaks and uh, Chief Kim Jacobs for uh, their work over in the legislature. They have been very much a part of our working committee uh, and have provided outstanding feedback on behalf of the city. And much of their input has been reflected and shaped in the legislation that's currently pending before the legislature. And so I want to let you know uh, they've been representing the city very well over the legislature as well. So thank you. Uh, and then finally, let me just applaud uh, the Mayor Ginther and City Council for taking the initiative and the leadership on behalf of the state of Ohio as uh, the largest city in, this, in the state of Ohio and an institution that many other cities look to. I think this step is a great step uh, for all municipalities in Ohio because if Columbus can do it, it really provides, I think, an opportunity for other cities to be able to do it as well. So let me just tell you a little bit about what we're doing in the Ohio legislature. Um, we introduced uh, House Bill 407, which, by the way, is a bipartisan bill that would require law enforcement agencies that use body cameras to adopt policies for operation and require agencies to make them available to the public. Again, I won't read through all of my notes other than to say that uh, much of what is in the policy that was presented today is also a part of what we're going to require within state law. Uh, so for example, um, every law enforcement agency in Ohio that would have body cameras based on House Bill 407 would require that law institution to adopt a public policy and most importantly, make it available to the public so that everyone knows and understands the rules to which body cameras are being utilized. So for example, here are some of the areas that must be addressed per House Bill 407. Which officers are required to wear body cameras? Activities during which operation of body camera is mandatory, optional, or prohibited. Standard procedures for obtaining consent to operate cam the camera when entering a private residence and its exceptions as illustrated in your um, policy proposal. Standard procedures for reviewing citizen complaints and conducting internal investigations. Standard procedures for responding to public records requests. Record retention requirements such as how footage is stored and the duration of time the footage is retained. This is an important item here because what we found is that some of the cost uh, limitations uh, are rooted in the data storage and the size of the data over time of what it collects. And so our state law, um, while this says you have to identify how much time you're going to hold data, uh, we're also looking at legislation that would really give municipalities the ability to jettison data that is sort of um, routine or not being used in an evidentiary matter. And so uh, if uh, Council uh, Member Hardin, if I'm a police officer, I stop you for a red light, for running a red light, you know you ran the red light, uh, and you go, you pay your ticket on Monday morning, do we need to keep that footage for a year, uh, using up space on the, uh, on the server? And so it's things like that that seem like small things, but could actually be significant in terms of cost in the big picture. Uh, 
whom within the agency has access to the footage. Um, again, we followed, as the City of Columbus did, the PERF report you heard. Um, we followed the guidelines that were identified in the PERF report, and so these are things that uh, have been, I, I would say, significantly researched to show uh, that these are things that must be addressed in order to, to utilize a body camera policy in a way that's effective. Um, so whom has access to, to, to the footage? So who can alter or redact uh, that footage? Whom within the agency may edit footage? Uh, same thing. Uh, sanctions for an officer that does not comply uh, it, with any provision in the body camera. And that may be one of the differences where uh, our state law required that we identify the policy. It's not telling you what to have as the policy. It's just saying that that policy should be publicly stated in your public document. Devise, devise a plan to review technology to determine the best practices, and upon ad adoption, the policy must be made available to the public, maybe the most important thing. Um, and then finally, let me just kind of cut to the chase of, I think, something that you'll want to hear. Um, House Bill 587, which was introduced more recently, and I, I should just, you should note that we spent the better part of a year in interested party meetings, and so certainly uh, Chief Jacobs and Deputy Director Speaks were part of nearly all of those meetings, if not all, uh, but we had, we invited chiefs from around the state. Uh, we invited directors, safety directors from around the state. We pulled research from nearly every municipality that has um, body cameras and looked at every legislative items that, that states have. And, and again, the same thing that we kept coming up to was the cost, the cost and, and what it would be, what we require for municipalities to implement body cameras. And so uh, we recently introduced House Bill 587, which is a little more, uh, I would say, uh, strong in terms of requiring municipalities or law enforcement agencies to have body cameras because that's exactly what it does. But it also does a couple of other things. Um, first, it appropriates $50 million to law enforcement agencies to assist them with the cost of implementing body cameras, whether that's for the server or even retroactive. And so uh, if this bill is passed, and so you can all write the Speaker of the House and encourage them to get this bill passed with me, uh, but you would have the ability to go back and recover some of the costs that you've uh, spent funds on. And I think a great case is the fiber optics uh, that was talked about earlier. I mean, that is classic because it does a lot more uh, than provide the bandwidth for footage to be stored and moved and all those things. It, it really creates the opportunity for other fiber optics to be laid, and there's economic development implications there as well. Um, but it establishes a fund of $50 million. It also reappropriates some funds that are dedicated from um, casino funds that come to the state that are dedicated to safety for body cameras over the course of five years. It also allows for uh, law enforcement agencies, after it requires them to adopt um, uh, a body camera policies and um, processes, it uh, also requires them to, uh, or requires the state to um, establish a committee that would work with them to evaluate best practices and make adjustments to the law uh, as we learn more about the use of body cameras and more importantly, uh, as technology evolves because that's what we know. The technology will certainly change between now and the next several years. And then so finally, um, the last bill that, there were three bills that we were looking at. One, to establish uh, the policies, uh, two, to create a fund and uh, allow municipalities or law enforcement agencies to access those funds. But three, and this is the one that we still are working on, and we've got some drafts of the bill, uh, but it's currently sort of, and, and uh, it just reminded me that uh, Council President Klein uh, was very much a part of the initial discussions of this third bill, which is around record retention and the use of records. And so we currently, um, have been drafting legislation and having interested party meetings. And some of the things that were outlined in the presentation today uh, would be addressed, but those are very complicated matters. Uh, those are very complex matters because it interacts with various aspects of the law. Uh, and most importantly, we wanna ensure that whatever we do, whatever we put into state law doesn't become um, um, a factor that you know, prohibits or has a negative impact on evidence being collected or uh, storage or any other 
uh, open records requests or privacy matters that uh, could be negatively affected. And so I feel very confident and good that the conversation within the legislature is robust. Uh, and while I won't be there next year to uh, help guide it, I, I really believe that it has legs. And I think that uh, most of the legislators who represent urban areas uh, are very much supportive of uh, body cameras. And I, again, want to just commend the city of Columbus for your leadership in helping us work through what I think is, is going to be uh, an improvement to uh, law enforcement execution throughout the state of Ohio. Thank you. Representative Boyce, thank you very, very much. We appreciate that. I think it's significant that everyone understands that we have been the leader in this process in a variety of different ways. And your engagement on the state level has been certainly beneficial. So thank you very, very much for coming down and speaking to us this evening. Thank you. Before we have, uh, there are members of the committee, but I think the council has questions. So why don't we answer some of the questions from the council members, then I will have members of the committee speak to their engagement, and at that time, after they're finished, we will entertain communication from the community. Council President. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, perhaps the best person to direct some of these questions is to uh, Director Speaks, uh, Deputy Director Speaks. Um, well, are all the models tested, or at least in the final two negotiations, do they all have audio? I'm sorry, do they Do they have both have audio, or is it just video component? Uh, yes, both. Both, President. Both audio both, and video? Yes. What's the uh, plan um, as it relates to proceeding with the General Assembly on public record law changes, knowing that... Uh, the General Assembly can sometimes be a little slower uh, to enact laws, but yet this being, I know, a priority for me and the mayor, uh, are we still planning on proceeding uh, despite uh, what could be any hiccups at the State House? Yes, our uh, policy, again, is very well balanced. So, yes, we will proceed under the proposed policy. Uh, having said that, if our ORC recommendations are adopted, uh, I think we should go back at that point uh, and redo the policy. Right now, again, it's very balanced. Um, if, in fact, body camera footage, they would take our 14 additional exemptions and make that into law, then, quite frankly, the officers could leave the cameras on, for example, inside of a residence the entire time. The problem, quite frankly, is this. In order to protect privacy and dignity, let's take the video of the inside of the home uh, on the domestic violence. Uh, there, an officer would have had the discretion to turn that video camera off. Let me give you a hypothetical. What happens if all of a sudden somebody runs out of the room or into that room with the officer? The officer may not have time in which to turn that camera back on. Um, if the law was changed, the officer could simply leave the footage on the entire time because we wouldn't have to worry about protecting privacy. Please let uh, us know on council how we can be advocates at the State House um, so that we can err on the side of having the officer always have yes. his or her body camera recording, knowing that there is possible redaction uh, for state record law exceptions exactly. uh, and any sort of advocacy that we can play so that we're erring on the side of uh, of transparency and accountability as it relates to the engagement of the camera being on. Agreed. Um, One thing that uh, was not discussed, and I'm curious if the, um, the committee discussed this, is any interaction with a, that is not an investigatory stop, a call for service, traffic, pedestrian, SWAT, OVI, use of force, arrest, just a regular encounter um, that is just police officer to citizen. If the, if the uh, person uh, that is engaging in a conversation with the police officer requests, that the officer turn on the camera? Is that something that the committee took into account? Just perhaps the person they're talking to doesn't have uh, trust in the police department, maybe suspect in the police department. Is that, uh, would that, can the officer then decline to say, no, I'm not gonna film you, or would that be something where the officer would oblige? Um, we've discussed this internally. We believe that if someone wants the camera on, we will turn the camera on. Conversely, however, if a person wants the camera off, no, the public will not dictate how a law enforcement officer utilizes that tool, there may be very good reasons why the officer wants to keep that camera on. Um, so in terms of turning the camera on, I don't see there's a problem. In terms of turning the camera off, yes, that, that is an issue. We 
And just to be clear, that when it comes to redactions and exceptions to public records laws or the policy that's going to be recommended to council and to the mayor for body re or body camera uh, video and public records requests, uh, the camera will still record the incident in question. The question it just becomes an issue of whether it is redacted and then handed over to the public. So there will still be a video recording that exists. Exactly. So it's not like that there's there's going to be in certain situations that you show and there's still camera footage yes. should something arise that is suspect or questionable for accountability purposes it just may fit under an exception of whether it's a public record exactly but we would like to either blur out the face or blur out some parts of the audio that is in great contrast <laughs> to what other states are doing florida california come to mind in which body cameras are not a public record and we think it's horrible public policy the reason the very reason you want body cameras is for transparency and so we would utilize, please. Councilman, also the one thing that needs to be known by the community is regardless of the redaction, the original video is always the same. The original video is never ever to be edited, uh, redacted over or anything removed. There's a audit trail that comes along when that video is redacted. There's an audit trail who went in there, who saw it, at what time, what date, and the redaction. So if you will, the storage space, you will have your original video always, and then you will have the redacted video. So I think it's important that the community knows that the original video will never be redacted uh, so that that's the only thing that you see. And so when you video. say the word redaction, you're just for layman's terms, you know, I'm not a video expert. Uh, like blur, you, blurring, you mentioned that, direct, Deputy Director Speaks, blurring over a face or blurring over a, a gruesome, Exactly, yeah. or the uh, elimination of audio where someone is given their social security number. Mm -hmm. That audio is just deleted out. It's only on the redacted video is where it's deleted out. On the original video that is maintained in accordance with the uh, uh, public records law and our uh, retention period, that is not changed at all. And then uh, on the technology side, Commander, um, you mentioned that the the technology is constantly improving. It could get to the point where a tick in an officer's heartbeat could trigger a camera, pull, withdrawing the weapon from uh, in, engaging the weapon that could, could trigger the camera without having to manually turn on or off the camera. Are we, from an infrastructure standpoint, um, what concern of mine is that would we have to change vendors and does that mean for docking stations is it, and we have to reinvent the wheel for fiber optics or is this something that with and again, pardon me for my technological ignorance, but is this something that as the body camera itself evolves that our current infrastructure will be in place to continually upload footage regardless of who the vendor is so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, uh, so to speak, on the uh, ability for storage or buy a new server or a different brand of server? Because I know oftentimes in, when we have technology legislation, we tend to waive competitive bidding because once you go with brand A, you would have to start over from scratch and build all new infrastructure, which could run in trillion or millions of dollars versus you know a couple hundred thousand dollars. Is that something that we're cognizant of as we look to pick the current vendor, whoever that may be, uh, and then moving forward as technology does advance, which I think will be beneficial to the use of the body camera to the public and the police officer? Yes, sir. Deputy Director King and uh, Carrie Bonaventura uh, both took that into consideration. Uh, our testing included uh, what is able to be, the most important thing to us is, is that in five years if we change a vendor, we want the ability to have all of our videos back. And we want that to be able to change over to another server or however. Uh, the infrastructure and the fiber should take us well uh, into the next uh, setting. Uh, the um, infrastructure and the substations uh, won't change uh, as far as fiber being in there because we're putting that into the subs that don't currently have it. Uh, I'm not very technical either. So as it was explained to me, in some of our sub substations, we have a very small pipe. We need a very large pipe and technology, uh, DOT is putting in a very large pipe. Mm -hmm. So we should be fine for the future. But as with technology changes, we have to be flexible in that that could occur. Uh, however, I will say that the one thing that um, uh, these vendors do is uh, they reverse engineer each other like crazy. So if one camera company or vendor has it, 
eventually, within a short period of time, the other ones get it as well. That's all the questions I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council President. President Pro Tem Tyson. Thank you, Chairman Brown, and certainly I have thoroughly enjoyed this presentation this evening. I know we've talked previously about this, but I'm glad that we're having this in the uh, in our viewing and um, listening audience have an opportunity to hear this presentation. The question I have is um, kind of added on to what Council President Klein was asking. Certainly we know that technology changes and we just mentioned that there is going to be some body activated technology that's going to be coming out soon. So the question is if we were to go to body activated mm -hmm. cameras and again and I, as he just mentioned certainly we tend to once we have a vendor we tend to keep that vendor because it's all about the security. We don't want anyone else having our data. So the question is, is the two companies that you're looking at, are they also um, looking at the body activated cameras? The automatic triggers. The automatic triggers, yes. <coughs> uh, as far as some of the technology that I talked about where the holster is involved, uh, that's one particular company and it didn't make it to the cut. The triggers that are currently in our mobile, uh, in our cars, uh, if I may just speak freely, in our cars, uh, those have triggers. When officers reach a certain speed or when they brake heavily, uh, uh, lights and siren are turned on for uh, emergency vehicle response, uh, those automatically activate the, the camera. The vendors that we are down to are in the process of including technology to tie into, and I don't know, ma'am, how they do that because I'm as, President Klein, I'm not very technical, but when that occurs, so too will the body camera come on. So that technology is. If I, if I may, count, uh, President Pro Tem, Mr. King is here. I think he can answer the question with more clarity. Uh, Ivan? Thank you. Not to disparage <laughs> Commander Strasbaugh by any means. Thank okay. you very much, Councilman. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. President Klein, other council members. Uh, Commander Strasbaugh is correct. Uh, the cameras that we have negotiated down to uh, do provide uh, in the future the ability to have the camera automatically turn on or automatically shut off. Thank you. Now, the other question I'll ask is that I certainly know that um, we're looking at outfitting, well, 4,232. 40, and then absolutely and also purchasing additional uh, cameras so that if any of them were uh, to be inoperable, we could certainly remove that camera and add the, uh, a new camera to our officers. So let's just talk a little bit about um, kind of the implementation and the timeline. Sure, be happy, happy to, uh, Council Member uh, uh, Tyson, members of Council. Um, Again, we have approximately 1,900 officers, all first responders, 1,432 uh, will have, each will have their own body camera. Those secondary folks will not. We have a phased in system. Uh, it's phased in for a number of reasons. First, we start with our traffic bureau, and we have after that the bicycle uh, unit, about 154 officers, our recruits, second shift patrol, day evening watch, third shift, first shift, and then phase eight, the final phase, SWAT. The reason we did phases for several reasons. Uh, number one, that's the national recommendation that you phase it in and you initially work out the bugs uh, that inevitably will happen with technology. Number two, it allows us time to put our uh, fiber optic infrastructure into our substations. Uh, the infrastructure is not needed for our traffic bureau, which is why we're going to them first, because police headquarters where traffic bureau reports already is equipped with the fiber optics. Third, uh, the Traffic Bureau has less of an expectation of privacy, if you will. They're, they're out on the roads as opposed to officers going into homes and businesses. Uh, this will allow the legislature some time to work on those uh, public records amendments that we talked about. Uh, so uh, eight phases, and we're able to phase this in depending upon funding that we're allocated. <laughs> Funding is always a concern, and just so based upon that, just realistically, I know since we have um, an eight million dollar budget, so realistically, these eight phases, I'm sure you have you had any conversations at all about 
the timeline to get to phase eight? Well, as Director Pettis said, we are on track for phase one by the end of this year with our traffic bureau. Um, as you know, we're in the middle of budget discussions now. I don't want to haphazard uh, an answer on that, but certainly I would hope within the next two years max, by the way, it's eight and a half million, uh, eight phases, these are the direct costs. There could be some additional costs with respect to indirect. Those are some of those unknowns we talked about before. All right, so two to three years probably. Probably. Thank probably. you. Yes. Uh, Council Member Shannon Harden. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Brown, for your leadership, and certainly thank you to the Department of Public Service, our uh, Public Safety, and the committee uh, that did this thorough research. Um, Representative Boyce stated that uh, HB 407 uh, dealt with who would be able to redact the information in our plan, who, who has that? Uh, and, and I think uh, Commander Strasbourg talked about it too. Uh, who, who in our, within uh, the city of Columbus would be over redacting information or video? Thank you for the question, uh, Council Member Hardin, members of council. Uh, uh, police has its own public records unit. Uh, we are blessed with that, unlike many jurisdictions who uh, do not have that expertise. So we have an entire unit dedicated to public records. They would take on this function. And they're on the civilian side or the? Civilians, okay. yes. Um, in, in your research in terms of uh, rollout, in terms of uh, folks who already have this and best practices, what do we expect our, um, uh, after training our, our failure rate that first as we, as we, in terms of turning on and turning off? Like what should we expect in terms of, of, of officers uh, forgetting to turn on in instances and was that documented in, in other cities in terms of uh, uh, their ability to understand and operate the equipment? Sure. Um, I would hate to haphazard a guess on some percentage. Um, I have not seen a study on that issue. I, I have not seen a study on that exact issue. As you know, here, let me just say this, here in Columbus, it is part of the policy, and failure to adhere to the policy may result in discipline. Any other council members? Council Member Page. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I have a couple of questions, one particularly about the 90 days storage for the non-evidentiary material. Does that align with the amount of time that we keep other non-evidentiary materials like the dash cam? Uh, yes, the re records retention policy um, has not changed. Remember, body cameras may be a new technology, but We've dealt with public records for years and years, so that has not changed. And if an individual, like a citizen, wants to make a complaint against an officer, mm -hmm. they would, in, I guess, theory, have 90 days to request this body cam footage or any other non-evidentiary footage within that time. Well, so it's a somewhat different issue. Complaints against police uh, against an officer should be made within 60 days to internal affairs. One of the reasons that the records retention is put at 90, it may take a week or so to process. So if we get that complaint within 60 days, we'll be sure to have that footage and retain that footage. I might also add that if uh, in one of the policies, and forgive me, I, I forget the number off the top of my head, but if an officer believes that uh, they have quite frankly screwed up, for lack of a better term, or believe that they'll get a complaint against them, they are under a duty to report that. And so we'll be sure to be looking at that footage. Uh, additionally, as we talked about before, uh, we'll be uh, monitoring management-wise the body camera footage. Councilman Sandiano, good for now. Please. Thank you again, Chair Brown. And I know we talked about this briefly, but could you talk about the disciplinary policy if an officer forgets or doesn't turn the camera on or off? Um, discipline may, we have, how many policies do you think we have? I, I would hate to. Hundreds. Um, I can't give you an exact number with, with respect to our standard operating procedures, but failure to adhere to any one policy can result in discipline. I can't tell you exactly what that discipline is. It depends on the unique fact and circumstances of that particular case, but it includes up to firing. Chief, you wish to speak to the issue at all? I was just going to say that um, the uh, disciplinary process works as accord in accordance with the 
the agreement that we have with the union. Um, and it, so it could range from positive progressive uh, action to uh, suspension or termination, as the director said. But um, suspensions and written reprimands come if we've identified that as critical misconduct. Otherwise, it would normally be progressive discipline, starting with um, uh, documented constructive counseling. And we've used a range of that. And again, it goes back to whether it's negligence, rec recklessness, intentional. you know, intentional or, or some other um, act. Councilmember Stenziano. Uh, thank you, Chairman Brown. Just a quick question. I really appreciate all the committee's work. Uh, up to this point, what public input has there been f uh, engaged with the committee? I know you took the best practices and compiled all the four uh, kind of programs or recommendations were out there. Just curious if during uh, making these recommendations, has there been uh, outside public input? There's been the tremendous uh, input from the public. We've had seven months of public meetings, a variety of uh, the public showed up at these meetings. Media showed up at these meetings. Uh, there was a public debate at the, uh, the Confluence Park regarding body cameras. There's been various articles in the media regarding uh, the, the committee's efforts, uh, various uh, uh, taped programs on the news media regarding the, the efforts. We had a televised public hearing at, uh, I think the name of the church, at uh, Faith Ministries uh, Church uh, on body cameras. And tonight is another great example of, of public input. Uh, that comes from President Pro Tem Tyson. Yes. Thank you, um, Chairman Brown. Just, just a comment. I do really appreciate your leadership and um, certainly and you bring a unique leadership to this from being um, the previous safety director as well as now as a council member and seeing it from all sides. So I appreciate your leadership. I also appreciate the work that Deputy Director um, George Speaks has done, the chief, the committee. Um, I'm pleased that we have gotten to a point where now we're able to have additional public comment that the proposal has been brought to this body. And um, so I'm glad that we are at this point and, uh, and we'll keep moving forward with um, getting input as we will tonight. Appreciate your um, work on this, President Klein. I know the mayor has certainly been um, integral to moving this forward. So I'm glad we're at this point, and I'm glad that we're having the ability to have additional input from, from um, our residents tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Page. Thank you, Chair Brown. I'm just looking at your phases on the last page here, and recruits are like phase three. And it's my understanding that typically recruits will be paired with a more experienced officer on patrol. And so they will be phased in later. So could you see an incident where a recruit would have a body camera, but maybe the person that they are training with does not have a body camera? Uh, during the initial setup, yes, it's very possible. Uh, as Director Speaks alluded to uh, earlier, committee of community members, uh, law enforcement personnel, subject matter experts, have collaborated to develop the body-worn camera policy. I think this gets to some of the other comments that people have made. I would now like to invite some of the committee members to share their experiences on the committee, and I would like to say thank you. I know the meeting's going a little bit long, but for the community to be able to offer their comments, uh, we're gonna answer their questions as well. So with that, I don't know if uh, Pastor Dexter Wise is present. I'm going to ask, and since he's a minister, if he could keep his comments to three minutes. <laughs> I know that may be a challenge, but I know he can handle it. Well, I don't know whether it's ministers or politicians. I don't know which ones. <laughs> but thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Councilman Brown, to our safety director, to chief police, and certainly to Director Speaks. I do want to thank especially Director Speaks for involving me in this process. Uh, I typically don't like to do things this long. Uh, it's a long commitment that we made to be in this process, but this is a serious issue in our community, and it's something that I wanted to be involved in when asked. The main thing that I think should be communicated is that with all of the details, with all of the process, what was communicated to me, what I received, is that the leadership in this city has a heart to do this. And the fact that we're even talking about it means that there, that there is something that is positive about it. 
Uh, what the committee has put together obviously is not the last word, uh, but the fact that we're talking about it, the fact that we were involved in it, and in my case, I got a greater education and appreciation of what it means to wear a body camera, what it means to be on both sides of the camera, and in some senses it seems just simple, just turn it on or turn it off. But if you're in those kind of situations, which we had an opportunity to do in a certain role playing and so forth, it's really more complicated than that. So the thing I want to con convey uh, to this body is that I felt that I was, uh, uh, my comments, my, my um, suggestions were heard, that they were uh, included, but most of all, that the people who are in leadership want to do this right. And that's the main thing to hear. I think in many communities, we have leadership who don't, don't even want to talk about it. And if they do want to talk about it, they want to talk about it in a way to make it the most possible to keep information away from the public. So I am confident that what we didn't get right, we have a heart in this community to get right, and we will get right, and I appreciate that. Pastor Wise, again, thank you for your engagement, sir. You know, I know everyone's time is valuable, and the amount of time you committed to the process was absolutely significant, and I truly appreciate you taking the time to come down this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gail Patrick, attorney from uh, in the city of Columbus. President Klein, Chairman Brown, the rest of city council, Thank you for the opportunity. My role was to research, analyze, and explain body-worn cameras, BWC issues, variations, and choices made by different entities, as well as prepare material for the committee's discussions and deliberations. The committee also learned from the expertise of various topical professionals. They participated in simulation, as Reverend Wise just reported, of various kinds of scenarios where the cameras are often used. The committee began their hearings on October 22nd, 2015, and ended June 8th, 2016, so it was a deliberative process. The committee members each received a five-inch binder containing materials covered by the topical recommendations of the United States Department of Justice in concert with PERF. The materials included current police department BWC policies across the country, BWC state legislation, articles illustrating a variety of viewpoints about BWC issues, a list of links to actual body camera videos, and nationally suggested policies for police departments implementing because the ACLU, the FOP, and other entities had also promulgated policies that were of national significance. The committee members offered their expertise on issues such as privacy, technology, criminal justice, and other areas of discussion as was needed. Outside speakers explained the BWC equipment, we learned a lot about that, video issues such as redaction, press concerns, and the Ohio public record laws. There were long and thorough discussions about privacy since current Ohio law doesn't provide for video redaction. So if an officer entered a home to do a well check on an elderly person, or if they went to the wrong address, that video would be a public record. It also would be on YouTube in all likelihood, as you heard there's more than 700 channels, which would provide information for any scammer or predator to use. Because the video would show the home's contents and in some cases, the vulnerabilities of the homes, young, old, or disabled. And the BWC videos, as you saw tonight, about people ODing are very disturbing. And they affect not only that person's current but prospective employment possibilities, but they also affect family members. I'm very concerned about the poor young child in the videos for this, that we've seen about the couple ODing and how that will follow, because remember, once it's on YouTube, it doesn't disappear. It's there permanently to follow you. Other recommendations, the departments do different things on turning the cameras on and off. They varied in their responses. Another issue, a couple that didn't get discussed is, are we gonna show suicide victims on camera? Do those videos, should they be shown? Can a crime victim ask not to be videotaped? What are we gonna do when a witness says, I'm not talking <laughs> if these cameras are on? 
because being video could put a person's life in jeopardy. It could subject them to some nasty pranks. It could also fray the fabric of the neighborhood and how neighbors get along. If you've had a chance to read the recommendations, you will have seen the thoughtfulness and thoroughness balancing public needs, police department constraints, and individual civilian circumstances have been weighed. For my part, my top five activities for this project were I read every statute bill proposed or enacted concerning body-worn cameras in the United States. I reviewed all the policies adopted by police departments across the nation, including public ones and some not so public. I watched numerous BWC videos. I can't tell you how many people I've actually seen die, more than I certainly ever expected to. I digested articles, presentation, and program transcripts that covered the pros, cons, fears, and hopes for BWC usage and I skimmed the court pleadings and decisions about the BWC video. It's been my honor to serve as staff, providing my expertise to the project. I appreciate the hard work and expertise that other staff, guest presenters, and the committee member themselves provided so that our city could have a BWC policy tailored to our community. Thank you. Attorney Patrick, thank you very, very much. And ladies and gentlemen, when she said she read all of them, believe me, she read all of them because she likes to discuss those with me. And I'm like, no, Gail, thank you very much. Uh, um, Abdi Sufi, would you please step down and offer your comments, sir? Good evening. Chair Brown, President Klein. Honorable members of the Council, Hardin, Page, Stinziano, and Tyson, thank you for the opportunity. I had the privilege and honor of being part of the nine member advisory council that have uh, been tasked to deliver the presentations that you have heard to this, this evening. For a little over seven months, we have worked extensively, uh, reviewed, examined, discussed in details of all practical aspects of police body cameras. We have looked into, as the director and the deputy director mentioned earlier, dozens of existing policies that other major cities have used. We looked into best practices and recommendations by law enforcement communities, as well as civil rights and civil liberty organizations. In my role as the New American Initiative Coordinator with the Department of Neighborhoods, then the Community Relations Commission, I brought my experience and relationship that we have, the people, uh, the different uh, ethnic communities, uh, multicultural communities, minority communities, and those experiences reflected the questions that I was asking during the sessions. <clears throat> we have considered different scenarios, debated all fundamental aspects about the police body camera as far as, as you have heard earlier, technology, privacy, transparency, rights and responsibilities of both uh, the mem members of the public as well as the Columbus police officers. Our res the result of our work is what uh, the deputy director have presented earlier. We do believe the proposal and the recommendation is that we have submitted to Ohio legislator is a comprehensive document that's actually unique for Columbus and we believe it will help reduce some of the concerns that the Columbus uh, members of the public and as well as the police officers may have. And we certainly appreciate your support and investment in making this project a reality. And thank you. Abdi, thank you very much. Again, the community component with New American Outreach as the coordinator is certainly beneficial. And certainly, as you said, he asked a lot of different types of questions that he thought that nobody else would come up with. And he got the answers as best as possible. Uh, and again, appreciate your time and effort uh, being on the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Laura Baker Morris, the chief prosecutor for the Columbus City Attorney, Mr. Rick Pfeiffer. President Klein, Chairman Brown, members of council, I want to begin by thanking, uh, for the, uh, thanking you for the opportunity to serve as staff 
on the body camera committee and also on the RFP committee. Uh, I also appreciate uh, City Attorney Pfeiffer uh, supporting me <laughs> and doing that along the way. I'm here to speak briefly on some of the indirect costs that have been mentioned throughout the evening. And I'm one of the indirect costs. Body cameras um, ultimately will result in evidence, and we're excited to see the kind of evidence that's going to be provided to prosecution of misdemeanor offenses, and they will certainly also reach the county prosecutor's office. But just as we look at the evidence that's going to be coming in, we have to consider um, that it's going to have a significant impact on the way that justice is administered, both in the Franklin County Municipal Court as well as the Court of Common Pleas. Court of Common Pleas, they're fortunate to have a brand new shiny building. It has Wi-Fi. It has a lot of technology. The Municipal Court, nah, not so much. Um, I'm very grateful uh, the members of council have been instrumental in getting Wi-Fi brought to the Municipal Court. It's in process now. Uh, we anticipate having it by November 1st. But that's going to be essential in order to receive the body camera video that's going to be taken by Columbus Division of Police and then provided. Also related to that, though, is the sheer personnel cost and time. Um, the members of the uh, Municipal Prosecutor's Office, City Attorney Pfeiffer's uh, Prosecutor Division. Not only will we be receiving body camera video from the Columbus Division of Police, we've already decided to, uh, started to receive body camera video from other law enforcement agencies for whom we prosecute in the Municipal Court. We're looking at hours and hours of time, not only to review the body camera video to determine whether or not we have good evidence on a particular case, but also we're going to have to first obtain that video, review the video, copy the video, provide it to defense and discovery, and display it in court. Uh, currently, the Franklin County Municipal Court courtrooms are not outfitted to display video. Um, I've advised court administration of the fact that the body cameras are coming. Um, we are working on the Wi-Fi capability, as I mentioned, but also we're going to need screening devices. Um, our office has been moving forward. We're in the 12th or 13th month of an 18-month contract for an electronic case management system to allow us to more efficiently provide evidence of all kinds, including body camera evidence that we anticipate coming in. And we appreciated council support in that endeavor, and we hope we continue to get your support so that we can, uh, of course, address the influx of information and body camera video that's coming to us. So thank you again for the opportunity to sit on the committee. Uh, thank you for uh, being supportive of us as we receive that information, and we look forward to the video that we can start receiving. Again, Ms. Baker, thank you very much for participating. I think everyone is beginning to get the picture that it's not just cameras. The implications are significant in a variety of different ways with associated costs. So thank you. Ms. Carla Rothman, Executive Director of the Stonewall Columbus. Thank you, Chairman Brown, Council Member. Klein, Council President Klein, everyone. Thank you so much for letting me speak today, and thank you so much for trusting me to be on this committee. This was not an easy process, I'm not going to lie. It was long, it was arduous, it was difficult. Some things were difficult to watch, uncomfortable to watch, and, and some things um, uh, did not go everybody's way. Um, a lot of times you think when these uh, committees are appointed, I'm sure that a lot of folks in my family and my friends, oh sure, well you're all just sitting around, you know, uh, trying to figure out, you know, what the policies and procedures are and they don't really know what goes into it. And they think we all agree. Well, we had some very strong personalities and we did not all agree on every single word of the, this policy. So I want to make sure that people know we took it very seriously. It was not easy. And um, I encourage everybody that uh, is wondering what it takes to, to, to be a part of government, to be a part of our city, and to, to work hard and volunteer, to get out there and do it, because we need your help. It's not just a bunch of us sitting around talking because we're critical thinkers and we, we really are involved in this because I'm a community servant and that's my job. I work with young people, I work with uh, the poverty, I work with folks that have mental health issues and in my work. and so. It was very important for me to be a part of it, but it's, I think it's impo important for every citizen, you know, to be a part of a process. And, and I'm glad everybody's here tonight. I'm glad we're filling this hall tonight with people that are interested in speaking their minds. It's very important. You know, I'm 52 years old. My mother did not even have a television. This world is changing. And we have got to keep up with it. As hard as it may be, uh, this is a generational thing. Everybody's got a camera. 
And so we need to make sure that we uh, have the, the best practices that we can afford. And just like when you buy your computer at home, you get the best you can afford. And you know tomorrow it's going to change. But you're going to keep up. I trust that our council will. I trust that our mayor's office will. I trust our legislature to do that. And um, believe me, um, I know for myself and I know this audience, I know we will hold your feet to the fire. Because that's what it's about, to have a wonderful city. And even if it's uncomfortable sometimes, uh, you've got to speak your mind. And you've got to say, you know what, we need this. And this is why. And, and you always heed the call. So I'm very, very proud of our city. I think this is going to be a model for the nation. I think we took all the things that people didn't do right. And I think we tried to do it right this time. And so I'm hoping that that is true. But always remember, this is just the policy of today. And it can always change. So speak up. Talk about it say this isn't working, this would work better, and I know we can do it together. So thank you so much. Ms. Rompman, thank you. Uh, I personally would like to express my appreciation for the entire Body Worn Camera Committee. I want to say thank you for dedicating your time and your effort to ensuring this policy is inclusive and thorough. In addition, I would like to thank the previous mayor, Michael B. Coleman, for initiating this process and convening this respective committee. And lastly, as far as the invited speakers, is Mr. Gary Daniels here, a representative from the ACLU. Mr. Daniels? Thank you, Council President Klein members of the Columbus City Council for uh, uh, allowing me this opportunity to discuss uh, Columbus's uh, body-worn camera policy. Um, it's clear uh, that the city and the committee tasked with coming up with this policy engaged in a thoughtful and deliberative process, uh, much of what you heard about tonight. Uh, we are thankful that you relied on the ACLU uh, model policy uh, to help guide you uh, through the deliberations. And uh, I would like to also uh, particularly thank uh, Deputy Director Speaks, who was very generous with his time uh, in uh, going over the policy and how these conclusions uh, were come to and for the uh, friendly debate uh, we had about uh, uh, parts of the policy. Uh, this is a complex issue, uh, no doubt. Uh, in the ACLU civil liberties world, uh, this involves police accountability, personal privacy, including those of officers, uh, government transparency, government surveillance, and open records. Uh, like others uh, here tonight, I've reviewed uh, many policies from uh, throughout Ohio uh, and have worked uh, countless hours uh, with state legislators uh, to hopefully get a bill passed that would uh, apply statewide standards uh, across Ohio so that uh, uh, at least with some minimum standards, uh, no matter where you go in Ohio, uh, those standards are the same. Uh, we do not uh, at the ACLU of Ohio endorse uh, individual policies, please keep that in mind. Uh, but I think you should be happy with much uh, of the policy, not all of it. Uh, I think it uh, reflects much of what the ACLU wants in policies, including when the cameras should be activated and deactivated, although that's not perfect, I'll get into that. Uh, providing notice to the public they are being recorded. Uh, the prohibition against uh, surveilling First Amendment related events such as rallies, protests, and religious gatherings, uh, and the retention schedule. I think, however, uh, that the city would benefit from at least uh, three uh, changes to the policy. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about officers being able to view recordings. Uh, we think the uh, uh, policy would benefit from not having officers view those recordings prior to making statements, filling out incident reports, and uh, related paperwork. This would help ensure officers do not take liberties with their reporting of controversial events that are not totally captured by the body cameras uh, and will increase public trust that these cameras are being used to provide police accountability. Uh, it's been mentioned uh, that body cameras uh, have helped blaze the trail with this and there are uh, repeated troubling incidents from across the country of police officers uh, not coming exactly clean with what happened with an incident when the camera doesn't totally capture what has gone on and you saw examples of that tonight uh, on the screen. 
Uh, number two, uh, the policy suggests uh, that officers should be mindful of sensitive situations uh, and individuals in, in certain situations. Uh, we think uh, it's better to remove as much discretion as possible from officers in those situations. It makes it even easier for the officers in those situations. So when you're talking about schools, when you're talking about private residences, when you're talking about houses of worship, uh, when you're talking about mental health facilities and hospitals and, and all the examples that are talked about in the policy, the de facto should be that those are not recorded uh, unless uh, you are engaging in a law enforcement activity, such as a, a drug raid, uh, chasing a suspect, uh, 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 executing an arrest, uh, things of that nature. Um, finally, um, and again, this isn't a, 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 a comprehensive list, uh, but uh, um, the policy does not require uh, cameras for plainclothes officers. Um, I understand uh, that there are those who say such a requirement is not practical, and I understand why they say that. Uh, but it was plainclothes officers who shot and killed Henry Green in South Linden. Uh, that's understandably very troubling for many Columbus residents, as it should be, uh, because perhaps cameras could have shed some light on exactly what happened uh, during that incident. Uh, so in light of that and uh, similar situations, uh, we ask that you reconsider that or find a solution uh, regarding this uh, omission. Um, in closing, Body cameras are only going to be as effective as the policy governing their use, and the willingness and ability of the city to ensure proper procedures are being followed and appropriate disciplinary measures taken when cameras are wrongly activated or deactivated, recordings are altered or tampered with, and when other problems arise. Unfortunately, there's a growing divide between many in Columbus and the police department, further hurt, uh, heightened by last week's killing of Tyree King. Columbus residents are clamoring for increased accountability, oversight, and transparency when it comes to police interactions with residents. Hopefully, the use of these cameras will provide much of what Columbus residents are looking for, although we should all be aware body cameras will not solve every problem or satisfactorily answer every question. But body cameras can certainly provide improvements over the current state of affairs. As a Columbus resident, as a representative of the ACLU, we want Columbus to have an ideal policy around the state and around the country. I don't think you're quite there yet. I've made some suggestions as to how it can be improved uh, and look forward to working with the city and city officials further on this matter. Thank you. Mr. Daniels, thank you, uh, Director Speaks. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Daniels, again, thank you for your comments. You've had an opportunity on many occasions to collaborate with the committee, and we'll continue to take your comments under advisement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. In, in regards to uh, Mr. Daniels' uh, comments, uh, practically speaking, either to the chief or to the deputy director, uh, when it comes to the recommendation of officers viewing the footage um, prior to filling out paperwork, um, how does that work in practicality? Uh, when is paperwork typically required to be filed? Um, if the officer has the video camera evidence, um, I'm guessing they can't plug it into their own smartphone and view it immediately, right? It needs, they need to go back to the station. It needs to be uploaded. Can they view it then at the station? Is that how it's going to work practically? At the same time, can they fill out their paperwork? I'm just walk me through what the real world implication is on this. Well, with respect to the technology, I can't tell you that's going to depend upon the vendor that is chosen. Um, Bob, do you have an answer to that on the committee? Depends on type of paperwork, uh, Mr. President. It, uh, an arrest uh, is done immediately thereafter uh, for full disclosure. Uh, I'm a very direct person. There are some programs out there where someone can review the video on their phone. There's an application that the vendors offer uh, that would allow that to happen. Oh, well, okay. However, you can also observe them inside of the vehicle. Uh, I would, of course, make sure that I check that fact with uh, Ivan back mm -hmm. behind me. Uh, he's more of a DSP. So guy. it's that readily, readily accessible? Yes. And if they went back to the um, uh, substation to watch it, or they used the back end client being in the cruiser, which has Wi Fi, or I'm sorry, not Wi Fi, but uh, cellular uh, connection, they can review it then. Um, most of the video that would be watched uh, would be just as a result of an arrest. Uh, typically, during a report, 
it wouldn't be really be uh, relevant because uh, you, you're just recording the facts that uh, the victim gives you. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, you know, it, it and, does. And let me just say that that issue was one of the most debated issues of the committee. We spent an inordinate amount of time on that issue. And I think what swayed the committee was, was three factors. Uh, first, that is Department of Justice sponsored PERF study that Representative Boyce was talking about. Uh, the PERF study recommends that officers be allowed to review the, middle, uh, the video for the sake of accuracy. Second, the video doesn't change. As Commander Strasbaugh says, the video is the video, will be there forever, an officer cannot change what is on that video. And third, we surveyed virtually every single jurisdiction who has body cameras in the country, and there is only one jurisdiction, Littleton, Colorado, that is following the ACOU recommendation on that. And then we touched upon this uh, when I had my opportunity to ask some questions, and I, I kind of want to go back to it because of something that Mr. Daniel said. Uh, regarding the um, the discretion of an officer to turn on his or her camera, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, clearly, I think that is you know it's a legitimate concern of determining whether what factors deter determine ultimately whether the camera should be activated or not activated. Um, if we're fortunate enough to be able to institute the public records exceptions at the state house. Uh, just to clarify again, then that yields a more transparent result because it would eliminate the discretion, correct? Because you could you could constantly run the camera, not have to worry about whether it fits within one of the sensitivity exceptions, uh, because you would have a public records law exception to deal with that sensitivity. It, exactly. But remember, I think um, I think Mr. <coughs> Daniels would acknowledge this. The ACLU is sort of in a bind on that issue. Uh, Mr. Daniels recommends that cameras be shut off before he said you go into a school, a hospital. Um, a, a church. Well, the problem is something can happen. Um, so we gave that discretion to the officer to determine whether or not that camera should be on. And as you just stated, if we get some more high revised code changes, what, we're able to leave that camera on the entire time because that footage would never become a public record. And I also do want to recognize just for the, the sake of um, discussion that Mr. Daniels also discussed the um, the plainclothes officers. I don't want to think that that I did, did not hear that. So there ended up in a lot of reaction from the audience, and, and there is an appreciation uh, for that argument. Um, and I'm hopeful that as we review these policies, that we can think of ways um, through other technologies that we can somehow capture uh, the the interactions that police have, whether they're uniform or non-uniform, um, with the public if that exists, but obviously balancing, sorry, balancing that against the ability of the fact that you are plain clothes and you're wearing a, a, a not a wire, a camera, um, you would give yourself up as not being plain clothes, which defeats the purpose of being plain clothes. So I, I, do, I just do want to recognize to the people that are here that um, that is a, a struggle and tension in my mind as we review this policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council President. Uh, at this time, we will take public comment I will call the name of the individuals that filled out speaker slips and the order in which they were turned in. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. Please share your name, address, and any organizations you may represent before you begin your statement. At this time, uh, Shannon Quinchetti, if I'm correct. Did I pronounce that correct? Shannon Quinchetti, Q-U-I-N-C-I-N-C-H-E-T-T-E. Reverend Joel King, I know he's here. They're not here. They're not here. Good evening, Council President, Chair Brown, to all the council persons, chief directors, and to the audience. Reverend Joel King, Associate Minister, Union Grove Baptist Church in the city of Columbus. Also, president of the National CAN organization here in Columbus, second vice president of the NAACP. 2012, we, as an organization, when we got started here in Columbus, decided to recommend to this city to get cameras on our offices. Uh, that was four years ago, and now we got two more years before we get it 100%. And we've heard this line before, in school, it says, we move at all deliberate speed. 
if we are serious, do we have the willpower as council to enact this legislation as quick as possible to get the cameras on the people, not only the unmarked officers, undercover officers, but also on officers that are doing clothes or doing work in, at other cities, at other businesses in the city after hours. The policy does not cover that in, in as a policy. What those officers getting paid by businesses that's working in the uniform of a colonial police officer, do they wear cameras and should be wearing cameras? Another point. My ACLU buddies talked about that as well. Uh, cameras can't solve everything. It's up to the community to do their part as well as the city council. But I just urge you, do you have the will to do that to make this happen? The practice controversial about pre-reporting. We talked about the cameras, the officers looking at the video. That's a problem they had in, Cal in uh, Colorado because they found out the officer would lie after he filled out the report. So he goes back and look at the camera and trying to match his report up with what the camera's saying. So that you need to look at that policy while we're making the policy now. Let's fix it now. We heard that when we put, pilot, when we put cameras in the cars. Well, the, the department don't have disciplinary action because of the union. Well, that's another challenge you as council got to do with the upcoming union contract, the disciplinary action to these officers. We've heard the cameras in the cars, oh, it happened to be off. The camera don't work that day, so we don't know what happened. What happens to that officer if we didn't do what he's supposed to be doing? We need to put that in the, in, in, in the policy while we're making it now and not after the fact. Because that's what's been happening in this city. We've heard that through the cameras in the cars. So we don't want the cameras to be conveniently to be off when they are on the officers and be conveniently not working when they're on officers. So I just encourage you to have the willpower. There are several state laws that, that even our president said if we have the willpower to ask the state house to give us that money to the city, then let's do that as a council body, as, as a community. To urge our residents to employ our, our representatives to make that happen, to make this city a number one city to wear cameras on our officers, to make all of our officers proud, make all of our citizens proud, make this city the city worth living in in Columbus. So I just urge you to have the willpower to put the policy in place immediately at all deliberate speed. Thank you. Mr. Terry Boyd, please. Council President Klein, to Chairman Brown, my good friend, yes. to the rest of the uh, city council members, uh, to the chief, chief, and to the safety director. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this evening. You've heard a lot of comments. My address, I'm sorry, Terry Boyd, 4083 uh, Eastern Way, Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. Uh, you've heard a lot of comments, and so I don't want to repeat things that have been said. Um, but I'm not here today uh, as your candidate for Franklin County Commissioner. I'm here today as a citizen and as a black man. A black man <coughs> who, in spite of my love for this country, this state, and this city, I am at risk every day when I leave my home that I won't come back to my family that evening just because of the color of my skin. Today, we are talking about body cameras. But over a year ago, well over a year ago, uh, as you stated, Council President Klein, you ran a campaign saying you would have body cameras on Columbus police as soon as possible. We still don't have them. And it looks like it's going to be two to three years before we implement this policy fully. Thank you for that question, Councilwoman Tyson. In fact, when Mayor Ginther was a candidate, he came to me and I gave him a blueprint on how body cameras could be purchased and our, all of our officers could be um, equipped with body cameras within two months of his swearing in. That blueprint still exists today. But still, we don't have cameras. I appreciate the, the deliberate 
process that we went through to study this. But I don't care how deliberate you can be, no process will be perfect. The issue is implementation. Get it going. Work out the bugs. But I'm scared to death because there's no accountability and there's no transparency. And that's what we need. I don't expect you to understand what it means to be pulled over, to be treated inappropriately, and possibly harassed just because you're a black man, which I've been by our police officers. But what I do expect for you to understand is that we need this process now. Two to three years from now is unacceptable. You've heard all of the other issues. I won't get into that. But it's time. It's time for leadership to stand up. President Klein, show real leadership and get this process going. We can't wait another two to three years to wait for a perfect process. We need it now. Mr. Tyrone Tomlins. Mr. Towns, T H O W N S. Good evening to all the people in the comfortable seats, and I appreciate you having me here. Those benches are pretty hard back there. A lot of things I wanted to say have been said here today, but Mr. I still Towns, have to before you start, give your full name, your yeah, address, Tyrone and Thomas. the organization that you're associated with, please. I'm Columbus, Ohio, 43232. I just moved back in the city so I can vote for you guys. I uh, represent Police Officer Acre Rights. Uh, I've been a representative for the organization for 20 years. I started in the organization because one night I was accosted by two officers off duty. And I guess I won. But as Cherry Board said, when I see lights come on in my mirror at night, I'm wondering if this is going to be a good exchange. And a lot of times it's not. It's too late for Tariq King. It's too late for Edward Hayes. It's too late for Dante Bell. It's too late for Dwayne Thomas, for cameras to be in the car. And I can go on with a list of names. But those are all people. Dante DeBell was shot in the back. Edward Hayes was shot in the back. We're still waiting on an investigation for Tariq King to come forward and tell us the circumstances. If the officer would have been wearing a body camera, it would have been less transparency there than what we have now. This community does not want to engage with our police department because we don't have transparency, and we're tired of it. We're tired of it. Did you look at your news this morning? North Carolina, where people are acting out in anger, frustration, they're traumatized. I'm traumatized. I heard a lady say earlier how many bodies she's seen on, the, on, on looking at the videos. Think of how many bodies I see every time I go out to one of these incidents where someone is not coming home or someone's laying in the street bleeding out, okay? We got a lot of work to do. Body cameras should not take this long. Other cities have implemented body cameras in far less time. And I do want to compliment you on your work. I, I, I sit back, I read the packet. This is the first time I've seen it. I'm very impressed at how you've addressed the issue of engaging with our citizens and having cameras on. But every officer, that's going to engage with a citizen should be wearing a camera, especially those off duty. I see them every week on campus engaging with people in inappropriate ways. I see them at the Ohio State football game engaging with people in inappropriate ways. They engage with me in inappropriate ways. A body camera gives me the, the, the ability to take that to task. And I, I'm going to say one more thing about transparency. If an officer 
engages with you inappropriate and you don't follow the report, that's a lack of transparency too. So if people ain't following reports and they're talking about it, that, that's a joke. But if they do file a report, let's have all the tools we can possibly have in place to deal with that. Now, the Tariq King killing is a shame. Columbus made national news for killing a baby. I don't care how you look at it. We killed a baby in this city, and we're still trying to get to the end of it. That's a shame. <laughs> Councilmember Hardin has a follow-up question to the uh, to the director's office. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Just on the the question now, the second time uh, on on special duty officers. When we looked at other cities that have implemented this, how did that influence our uh, overall policy in terms of uh, uh, deciding who uh, would be uh, wearing a, a camera and who would not? With respect to special duty, the great majority of other cities uh, allow officers. Uh, on a voluntary basis to utilize uh, body cameras. It is not mandated in the great majority of other cities that we found. Uh, that is one of the current topics in collective bargaining. Uh, therefore, I, I can't comment in depth on that discuss discussion. Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins. Sixteen Twelve Arlington Avenue, Mr. Los Angeles George Walkins, the chairman of solely vacant property in North Linden area. Um, I'm all for this, but it gets another tool for the for the police department. Also, I would love to know if plain clothes officer will have this, and I'm all for this. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Walkins. Uh, as the, the you already heard from the deputy director, that is an area of discussion currently. Thank you. Mindy Brown. Hello, my name is um, Mindy Brown. My address is 7849 Black Willow Drive, Blacklick 43004. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. I've never been a part of this. I've actually jotted a few things down. And um, first, I'd like to say that I'm very familiar with the crime here in um, Columbus, Ohio. I, um, I work in a medical profession at a level one trauma hospital, and I see it nearly every day I work. Um, I know that Columbus CPD risks their lives every single day. With that said, I also know that it seems to be a nationwide problem with excessive force being used by officers towards people especially blacks and minorities. I feel that um, having police body cameras will determine if police shootings are truly necessary. It is not fair to only take into account what a police officer says and to automatically assume that they are speaking the truth. An example of this would be recent, the recent shooting of Tyron King that people have mentioned. Um, Chief Jacobs herself said not to pass judgment and wait for a thorough investigation Yet at the same time, she got on all the local news stations and portrayed an armed robber with a BB gun that they wanted us to see appeared like the one that they carry. This is a large, there is, there is a large majority of the public that already have a biased stance on whether or not he was guilty because CBD stated he pulled a gun from his Mrs. waistband. Mrs. Brown, just a moment. And for all those of you in the audience, this is not a rally. This is a circumstance for individuals to give public testimony. Be respectful. You, I will have you removed. It's okay. Please just let me speak. No, you're entitled to speak, Mrs. Brown. Please continue. Yes. As I was saying, there's a large majority of the public that have already had um, have a biased stance on whether or not he was guilty because CPD stated he pulled a gun from his waistband, and despite the fact there were statements that he was shot after getting up and running. No one's talking about that really, though. If that officer would have had a police body camera in place, then we would be able to determine who, in fact, was telling the truth. As far as the policy that an officer would have a chance to review the video, the video footage that you guys have talked about today, um, I just want to say I don't necessarily agree. They, um, 
They are not using coverage to make statements now and should be able to account for whatever situation is at hand. If anything, that video should support what they have said, not give them an opportunity to get their statements straight. Thank you. Michelle Turner. Is Ms. Turner here? Madison Gibbs. Good evening. Uh, my name is Madison Gibbs. I'm at 3108 Indianola Avenue, uh, Columbus, Ohio, 43202. Um, I prepared something written. The potential tragic incident that Mayor Andy Ginther referred to in May and said we weren't immune to as a city happened in our city last week. The tragic incident that would cause, as he also said, divisions and discord happened, except it wasn't the murder of Tyree King that caused that division and discord. It was the division and discord, implicit racial bias, systemic racism that plagues our country, and finally a police officer with unchecked power that caused the murder of Tyree King. It will take, at first, acknowledgement and a commitment to working toward justice to undo centuries of injustice. But what we will do in this city and this community is implement a body-worn camera policy that will aim to decrease excessive force in our police department as it has been proven to do in large police departments across the nation. I know that Mayor Ginther and the City of Columbus are advocates of cameras being worn by our police department and the conversation now entails what that policy should look like. I propose the following principles, which have been designed and proposed by 34 civil rights groups in this country, including the ACLU. That body cams be worn at all times by every police officer that has the ability to make an arrest, not just the 1,400 first responders proposed in May and tonight. That body cams be turned on at all times. That body cams be public, developed with the public, of course, and the footage available to the public when requested, which I've seen is proven that police officers be required to submit their own incident reports before having access to the body cam footage. In conclusion, policies have to be implemented that are used to enhance civil rights, protect the Columbus community at large, and to protect specifically in this conversation underserved, underprivileged communities of color within Columbus. Because without them, body cams by themselves will only further protect the police officers wearing them, and that, at the very least, is unacceptable. Thank you. Um, John Ullman. Hi, members of the council. Uh, my name is John Ullman. I'm at 426 King Avenue, apartment 1L. Uh, I'd like to begin by expressing my gratitude to the council and to the committee who worked really hard, clearly, to <laughs> Uh, work out the finer details of this, and though I was not involved in those conversations, I get, have gotten a sense tonight of the immense level of detail and the many questions that go into this, and I'm thankful to you for putting that time into it. I'm glad to know that Columbus is on track to implement body cameras, um, but my purpose in speaking and testifying is to recommend that we move with the greatest amount of urgency in implementing them, that we implement them as thoroughly as possible, and I would like to reinforce the reasoning as to why they are important. So far in 2016, at least 725 people have been killed by American police, and 38 American police have been killed while on duty. That's nearly three people a day, every single day. Some of those people were children. One of them was only 13 years old, and he died less than two miles from this very room. As citizens of Columbus who got to wake up this morning and are still alive, we have an obligation to do everything in our power to prevent such a loss of life from ever happening again in our city. Irrefutable, unbiased camera footage of the events that led to the death of 13-year-old Tyree King is necessary to determine what actually happened and determining what actually happened is necessary to understanding how it happened. And understanding how it happened is the only thing that will ultimately give us the ability to prevent it from happening again. But we don't have that footage. It wasn't captured because the police who were present that night were not wearing body cameras. So to the question of when to implement police body cameras, the answer is now. 
to the question of how to implement police body cameras, clearly we have a good outline. I would like to support the ACLU's three recommendations to limit officer review before writing their own reports, to remove as much officer discretion as possible, and to include plainclothes officers as those officers required to wear body cameras. And I would like to remind the council that questions of personal uh, privacy versus transparency, questions of officer discretion, or of budgetary constraints pale in comparison to the reality of a 13-year-old child dead and us with no answer to the question of why or how it happened. Thank you. Mr. Brian Estabrook. Thank you, council members. I wrote some things down. My name is Brian Estabrook, and I live in Franklinton, 160 Martin Avenue, 43222. I rise in support of the body cameras, uh, but I do so with <laughs> many, many caveats. Um, firstly, I want to say cameras are not enough. We need robust civilian oversight of police activity in all stages of investigation, from the beginning to the end, not just review of outcomes that have already been decided. The president of the Police Foundation, which is headed by a former police chief, said, police, sorry, people will make the mistake of thinking that we can solve all problems by just giving cops a camera. But the question for me is, how do we actually evaluate the evidence that comes through? Many people here who I think may be more optimistic than me, <laughs> seem to think that if we actually had video of what happened last Wednesday to Tyree King, that we would actually be able to do something with it. But we look at just recent history and we see Michael Garner. We see Alton Sterling. We see just this week, Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa. Clear demonstrable video of police murders of civilians. And what's happened in those cases? Well. Michael Garner and Alton Sterling, nothing has happened to, to the police officers involved. And in fact, everybody got off, everybody got away with it. So what are body cameras gonna do to help us actually solve this problem? Let me propose that we, tru that we create a truly transparent, accountable uh, civilian oversight and review board that can review this video evidence, can review police activity, and can have oversight on what is done with that and how officers are disciplined and treated later. Short of this, body cameras will simply be nothing but an expensive budget line that does nothing to increase community trust. And actually, there's some evidence to support the fact that they may increase uh, uh, in inappropriate police activity. Um, there, there's a Cambridge study that basically says that um, officers who are given discretion of when to turn on and off the cameras, actually, uh, there is a rise in police complaints. Um, so I would heavily, heavily uh, ask the council to consider that. Earlier, the deputy director safety said, the film is the film, implying that there's no need to worry about interpretation problems. This is 100% incorrect. How many police-involved shootings, and I mentioned many, I, I mentioned a few of them recently, have, have been recorded that nothing has happened. The evidence obtained from body cameras is not neutral and it's not self-evident to police because they have a biased interest in the outcome. We should not and cannot let police treat it as neutral. We have to have robust civilian oversight and review embedded in every part of the process. Thank you. Marcus Gordon. Thank you, um, President Klein, Chair Brown, the rest of the council. Um, I am here tonight as, I'm sorry, Marcus Gordon, 3318 Edgebrook Drive, Columbus, Ohio. I'm here tonight as a concerned citizen and nothing more. Um, I applaud the city of Columbus. I applaud you guys for taking the initiative to implement body cams into the Columbus Police Department. My hope is that the cameras will help bring clarity to situations that otherwise would cause more questions than provide answers. 
But there's a bigger picture here, and that's the relationship between law enforcement and those that are in the underprivileged, underprivileged poor communities here, not only in Columbus, but across the nation. And until we take politics and personal interests to the side and take it out of the equation, these things won't change. In the age of social media and a never-ending news cycle, sensitive, complicated issues have been reduced to sound bites and headlines. So the question becomes, are the powers that be willing to invest the time, resources, um, and money to create lasting solutions for both the people and law enforcement as well. Um, Director Pettis mentioned it early on about transparency, and you've heard that word over and over and over again, transparency. I cannot stress the importance of it, but I'm referring to real transparency. In the material provided tonight, as it relates to the officer's discretion to turn the cameras on and off or what may be redacted, I have serious issues with that. 13-year-old Tyree King lost his life here last week, and as an average citizen, I was told to wait for the facts. But then I also turned on the TV to watch a press conference that to me painted a picture and began to tell a story and a narrative while not um, showing anything on the other side. That's not transparency to me, that's an agenda. The world gets crazier by the minute, but to ensure that the city of Columbus is safe, for me, my five-year-old black son, and all these people here, we need to have an open and honest dialogue about race in America, police brutality in America, and especially here right in our own backyard. Until we decide to sit down and really have a true conversation, um, body cams won't do anything at all. So I implore you guys to not only take this step, but an additional step to make sure we are doing everything that we can to make sure that we are protected and that this city remains to be how it is. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that will end all the public testimony. We've had, as a council, an opportunity to hear from the committee. We've heard from the Department of Public Safety on a very, very serious issue with regards to the commitment of monies and the subject matter regarding trust with regards to our Columbus Police Division and the citizens. First and foremost, I want to thank my council members, my colleagues, for being here this evening. I want to thank Mayor Andy Ginther for committing and saying he wanted to get this done. The Department of Public Safety's leadership, recognizing the value of innovation. Certainly, I want to thank my staff who helped put this all together. But most importantly, most importantly, I want to thank the community. If we have to work harder at the Department of Public Safety and the police officers and the firefighters who are sworn to take care of you, if you think they're not doing the job well enough, then we gotta figure out a way to deal with that. And we will figure out a way to deal with that. So I wanna thank all of you for coming down this evening. Everyone have a safe drive home. Good night, that concludes this hearing. <laughs>